Welcome to my world. Come on in and make yourselves at home. Welcome to my life. I know everything's gonna be all right. Welcome to my world. I oh, want you come on in. Welcome to my life. It's known as the Tiger's Den. Greetings to all of my subscribers. I want to thank you for being with me for as long as you have and the new subscribers that's coming on in. We want to say greetings and thank you for your time. This is from Toothless and the moderators. Welcome to the Tiger's Den. This is the voice of Cheryl. And welcome to In My Humble Opinion. I decided to kind of go a little different. with my page and what I mean by that is I decided to just kind of go back to just kind of just talking of course I'm going to give stories I'm going to give facts to the best of my ability but and I do understand that it's very, very hard to teach a people that they've been lied to the majority of their lives. I should say it's easier to lie to them than to teach them that they've been lied to for the majority of their lives. I understand that. I'm 65 years old. I was born at the end of Jim Crow. I've seen things that a lot of these people, especially in the metaverse, don't see and haven't seen. But if we keep going like we're going, we're going to see. Today we celebrate Juneteenth. And this was kind of a last minute deal because I had a Juneteenth video and it's still on my page uh, from 2022. I need to do some moderations to it, but I've taken a lot off of my hard drive and I can only find it on my disk. And since I'm not computer literate, I don't know how to get it back so that I can make the adjustments that I need to make. Because the rules have changed for YouTube. And I do adapt to and accept change. But what I want to tell you today is the story that we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. And this is not my opinion. I'm going to be reading to you from an article from Texas History. And I'll be sharing that with you. It's from the Texas Monthly. The illustration of the picture that's here is by Mark Harris. And so we want to give them their credit. And we want to... Thank the Fair Use Act that we can do this for commentary, scholarship, education. And it is my hope that you would leave with some education. You know, 
it's really hard talking to a computer even when you show your face when you don't show your face it's hard for me to just talk to a computer because I'm used to talking to an individual and so sometimes my mind wonders so just bear with me I'm all over the place it is not my intent but that's who I am and thank goodness I know who I am once we learn to be our authentic selves life will be a little easier doesn't mean we won't feel pain yep we'll feel pain and the dozen didn't go with we don't go with we i'm one of those people that's always correcting other people but i swear since i've been on youtube i've had to do more self-correcting than i imagined so it was probably like that all the time but i never paid it any attention but now that i speak to the public it makes a difference to me <laughs> and I guess I can hear it I don't know but let me share this with you because I will be going live tonight at 8 30 p.m. Central Standard Time and I'll be talking about the young thug trial I like to call him Jeffrey Williams. Let me share my screen. I think Woody has grown on us because I can hear myself sometimes saying that uh, I feel so discombobulated. Here we go. Texas history. The story we've been told about Juneteenth is wrong. The real history is much messier and more inspiring. And I don't want to mess up your name, Joseph. So I'm going to say by Mr. P. Joseph, June 2023. Also, I want to say that there may be some words used in here. I'm going to do my best to go by the YouTube guidelines and try to change some of the words uh, if they are words that would be offensive to someone. Unfortunately, I don't know all words that would offend anyone, but I'll do my best. And here we go. My first memories of Juneteenth began in church. I grew up in a predominantly black section of Jamaica in the New York City borough of Queens. Our small congregation at New Bethel Baptist Church consisted of Caribbean immigrants, such as my Haitian-born mother, native-born New Yorkers, such as me, and migrants from across the South, including Texas. As new parishioners arrived, they transplanted their food culture and folks way into our church rituals and traditions my mother prided herself on the excellence of her haitian cooking especially dishes such as jumu stewed chicken accompanied by rice and beans black or red and i hope i said that right and the sweet coconut dessert he occasionally prepared for other congregants. But we also relished those special occasions at church when the cozy upstairs room that doubled as a kind of a banquet hall was filled with the rich aroma of Southern soul food, cornbread, fried fish, and red velvet cake.
This was the early 80s, my elementary school years. One Sunday morning, as I sat on a light brown pew in New Bethel Sanctuary, I was wrapped as parishioners from Texas took to the pulpit and told a fascinating story of enslaved Africans who didn't hear news of their liberation until Union General Gordon Granger issued an order in Galveston on June 19, 1865, more than two months after Confederate General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. I was reminded of my mother's stories about the Haitian Revolution in which slaves overthrew French rule and to much of the world's surprise, achieved independence in 1804. That uprising inspired emancipation movements around the globe. Though it would be another six decades before freedom for the enslaved reached Americans, uh, reached America's shores. After the service, I overheard fervent conversations about slavery and the need to teach young children like me to forget. To never forget. And there is the photo. A Juneteenth celebration held in 1900s on East 24th Street in Austin. And that is from Austin History Center, Austin Public Library. I didn't know it at the time, but my experience of hearing about Juneteenth was similar to that of untold others across the United States. Juneteenth had been observed in Texas since 1866, and celebrations soon spread to neighboring states. As black Southerners fled north and west throughout the 20th century in what became known as the Great Migration, festivities cropped up across the country. My family didn't mark Juneteenth at home, but our Texan parishioners never allowed us to take for granted its special meaning. Each year we would commemorate the day, often during a Sunday service and occasionally during vacation Bible school. Only later when I learned that the stories of Juneteenth that I'd heard in church were part of a far more complicated tale. I'd first discovered black history through my mother's stories of our Haitian heritage and culture, traditions that she'd brought with her to a mid-60s America, convulsed by a civil rights revolution. Essential texts from that movement were found throughout my home. The autobiography of Malcolm X, various works by Angela Davis, the innovative thinker who was on the FBI's most wanted list in 1970, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s final book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? I vividly recall watching the Roots television min miniseries, which offered a groundbreaking examination of slavery in American popular culture. Juneteenth introduced a new layer to this story. I imagined myself as part of the Black Texas community, which dared to believe in dreams of freedom that were once considered impossible. As I grew older, my interest in history expanded. The more I found out, the deeper I yearned to go. Slowly, I came to realize that history was not just about the past. The stories it tells help us make sense of the here and now and might shape the future.
I eventually became a professor. My teaching and research interests firmly planted in the 20th century civil rights and black power movements. In 2015, I accepted a position at the University of Texas at Austin. And once I arrived, my understanding of Juneteenth became more intimate. I witnessed local celebrations in Austin in which black Texans acknowledged the day's importance, but also wrestled with its contradictions, knowing that real freedom had not in fact been achieved that day in Galveston. It was still a work in progress. While Texans celebrated Juneteenth with a particular zeal, many Americans still did not have the faintest clue about its origins, historical import, or contemporary renaissance. And that is resonance. That was until an improbable series of events transformed Juneteenth into a national symbol. Let me try to do it this way. See if I can get closer to the top. George Floyd's and believe it or not, I paid for a subscription. So I have a subscription. I hate when it does that. George Floyd's public execution by former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin on May 25th, 2020, sparked months of demonstration that swelled into one of the largest social justice movements in American history and elicited an unprecedented collective outpouring of racial grief. Against this backdrop, I was one of many who began to examine Juneteenth anew. I published a CNN opinion article headed, Make Juneteenth a National Holiday Now, arguing in part that Juneteenth offers America a new origin story. Black people are largely absent from our national narratives. Juneteenth, I suggested, offered an opportunity to correct that. Freedom. And that's a 2021 Juneteenth celebration in Galveston. In some ways, Juneteenth can be read as a response to Frederick Douglass' searing 1852 speech in Rochester, New York, now known as What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Douglass, a formerly enslaved black man from Maryland who became arguably the most important activist of the 19th century, assailed celebrations of freedom in a land scarred by slavery. This 4th of July is yours, not mine, he said to the audience. You may rejoice. I must mourn. On June 17, 2021, roughly a year after Floyd's unaliving, Juneteenth became an official U.S. holiday signed into law by President Joe Biden. It was the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Jr. Day. As enshrined, was enshrined in 1983 and a signal achievement in American history, drawing the country one step closer to publicly acknowledging its original sin of slavery. Yet, the real history of Juneteenth remains largely unknown. The myriad ways in which black freedom was persistently sabotaged, beginning with Granger's or original order and continuing through today. At a moment when our national narrative is hotly contested, the teaching of history is under attack, which lends more urgency to an earn, earn, earnest reckoning with the meaning of Juneteenth. What we are celebrating when we observe it and should be celebrating it at all is it actually an indictment of America, a repudiation of the 4th of July, 
Is it a day worthy of veneration, of shame, or of both? When General Granger first sailed into Galveston in June 1865, he was accompanied by roughly 2,000 troops. At the time, Galveston was the most populous city in Texas, with a bustling and lucrative port managed partly by black workers who transported goods and gossip from around the world. Granger and his staff commandeered a villa in town and set out on the impossible. mission of bringing a semblance of order and security to the largest succession state of the newly restored Union. The mood was dark, with cities and rural hamlets still reeling from the physical and economic devastation wrought by the war. About a month earlier, the Confederate Army had won a battle at Palmetto Ranch outside Brownsville. That clash the last major action of the Civil War had been waged more than a month after Lee's surrender in Virginia. Without the forceful appearance of Union soldiers, Black Texans had remained imprisoned within the convulsive clutches of a dying Confederacy. The stories of how General Order No. 3 was relayed to Gabbos. Let me see if I can get this right. Gavistonians vary, but Granger likely read the order aloud in a public meeting designed to spread the message to as many people as possible. The words, all slaves are free, served as a declaration of independence for more and a prov provocation to others. Granger and his troops often encountered a violent, anxious, fearful, and vengeful white population. Including Confederate soldiers and sympathizers who engaged in reckless attacks and looting in parts of Texas. Granger's order was based loosely on Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. The 13th Amendment, which made slavery unconstitutional, wasn't ratified until December 6, 1865. The order first declared that the formerly enslaved were free based on absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between black people and those who had presumed legal ownership of them. This is the happy news upon which most Juneteenth celebrations are based. It's also an oversimplified tale of what happened that day. Look at the wheels on that. I guess they were married. A buggy decorated. No, that's decorated for Juneteenth in Houston circa 1900. And that's Houston Public Library, the African American Library at the Gregory School. A common view about Juneteenth in both black and white communities is that black folks in Galveston and around Texas were slow to hear or fully grasp, grasp the news about the Civil War's end and the arrival of liberty. This is a story I was told in church. But that's not entirely true. Some portion of black Texans, especially those working in the port of Galveston, knew that the tide of the war had long ago turned in favor of Union troops. They'd also probably caught wind of the Emancipation Proclamation from travelers disembarking on the wharves. Further, they'd likely heard what must have seemed to be fantastical tales about regiments of black soldiers in the Union Army. News of impending, in, 
impending freedom had almost certainly reached other parts of Texas when enslaved African Americans from the Deep South were transported to the Lone Star State during the war. Texas was a haven for white slave owners fleeing Louisiana and other areas of the Confederacy being conquered by Union troops. But the news had little practical meaning. So long as the state remained under Confederate control, the arrival of some 2,000 federal troops appeared to mark an end to white rule over black Texans. But Granger's order limited and undermined the very freedoms that it promised. The relationship between former masters and the enslaved would now evolve into a vague contract between employers and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. Read the order. But how could black Texans enjoy freedom while remaining on plantations? Would they be allowed to leave, travel, or reunite with loved ones? Were they forbidden from becoming entrepreneurs and landholders? Further black men and women were warned not to flock to military posts. Since 1863, when black men were allowed to enlist in the Union Army, its military posts had become beacons for freedom. The sight of blue uniforms liberating secessionist ter territories often meant the promise of food, clothing, and reading materials. Granger's warning that black Texans will not be supported in idleness on military posts or elsewhere was an ad admonition, a no, an admonishment suggesting that They could not rely on federal troops, whether those Texans were seeking protection, searching for news about family and friends, looking for work, or in need of food. The troops were there to enforce liberation, but they would not necessarily support those trying to carve out a new life. This is why even after Granger arrived, many black folks responded to the news of freedom cautiously fearing reprisal. Yet, as word spread, some did walk away from plantations. Others rejoiced, exalted, and stayed put while planning their next moves. The park, Thompson explained, serves as a living memorial to generations gone by. It's also a repository of a story that is just beginning to receive its due. Fears among black Texans were often borne out. In the ensuing months, the beginning of the period that would come to be known as Reconstruction, racial violence spread. In one town, white Texas whipped dozens of formerly enslaved people formerly enslaved people who celebrated the news of emancipation too enthusiastically. White attacks against free black people range from verbal harassment and intimidation to physical assaults and even unaliving. Black Texans in, Gal in Galveston and other parts of the state navigated a new landscape at times, more dangerous and volatile than the one they left behind. The backlash of many white residents against the idea of black citizenship and dignity would become a normal feature of Texas political landscape, a legacy that persists today. 
just as limitations on black freedoms were baked into Granger's emancipation announcement, racial discrimination became embedded in public policies that propagated unequal housing and employment opportunities, wealth gaps, educational and residential segregation. Police brutally and political disenfranchisement. Black codes in Texas and throughout the South prevented African Americans from voting, securing fair labor contracts, attending racially integrated public schools, or owning land. For many years after Granger's arrival in Galveston, freedom could not be publicly enjoyed in some parts of Texas even on Juneteenth itself. And that's a Juneteenth celebration at Houston's Emancipation Park in the 1880s. Reverend Jack Yates is on the far left. And that would be Jack Yates right here where we can't see nothing, but that's the sign right there. Okay, and this is Houston Public Library, the African American Library at the Gregory School. That's what that photo is. On a chilly day this past fall, I arrived in Houston Emancipation Park and was joined by Erica Thompson, an archivist and historian who serves as community liaison at the African American Library at the Gregory School, which once housed the first black school in the city. Thompson had agreed to show me around the park, which sits just south of downtown in Third Ward, long a, long a center of the city's black community. Established in 1872, the park is among the oldest in Texas created by formerly enslaved locals who wanted a place to commemorate Juneteenth. Though the inaugural celebrations were relatively small, today they are citywide affairs that feature appearances and speeches by elected officials, religious and civic leaders, and a who's who of Black Houston. As Thompson and I walked the grounds, he pointed to the abstract mosaic sculptures that honored four of the community leaders who raised money to purchase the 10 acres of land, the Reverend David Elias. Dibble, Richard Allen, Richard Brock, and John Henry, Jack Yates. Located at the four corners of the park, the sculptures are the work of the local artist, Reginald Adams. The park, Thompson explained, serves as a living memorial to generations gone by. It's also a repository of a story that is just beginning to receive its due. The founders of Emancipation Park were all born in bondage. As pastors, tradesmen, political leaders, husbands, and fathers, they helped make Houston a wellspring of black social, political, economic, and religious life in Texas. After emancipation, Richard Adam quickly became one of Houston's most important political leaders, a talented carpenter and architect. He served as an agent of the Freedmen's Bureau, as a voter registration supervisor, and as an elected state representative. Allen designed Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, which was led by Jack Yates, who had become a minister and activist in the late 1860s. Yates also played a leading role in the founding of the Houston Baptist Academy, a precursor to Texas Southern University. And that's Houston's HBCU. 
Civil Rights Rally at Emancipation Park on June 21st, 1965. And again, that's from the Houston Public Library, Houston Post. A third sculpture in the park honors Richard Brock, who established a successful career as a blacksmith in Houston at a time when barriers to African Americans' entrepreneurship were almost impossibly high. He later helped found the St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church. Lastly, David Elias Dibble, was a self-taught preacher and founder of a Freedmen's Methodist congregation, now called Trinity United Methodist Church. Dibble collaborated with the Freedmen's Bureau, helped create a school within his church, and served as a trustee for the Gregory School. These four men and their contemporaries provided an incubator for educational advancement, cultivated tight-knit religious communities, and built a thriving political movement that propelled a number of formerly enslaved Black Texans into positions of power that made them prominent figures within the racially integrated Republican Party. After exploring the park grounds, I went inside the cultural center and gazed upon gorgeous photographs of 19th and early 20th century black Houstonians. One image depicts a well-to-do family outside a tidy home. Another shows a group of some 30 women and men during a Juneteenth celebration in the late 1800s. They look both prosperous and circumspect with some older men doffing their hats and younger women wearing white, exhibiting a kind of grace that racist stereotypes of the era insisted that black people could never possess. Studying these photos, I was struck by how much black Texans were able to achieve in the years immediately after the abolition of slavery. Their efforts paved the way for others. Fort Bend County, just southwest of Houston, became such a significant base of black political activism that unsympathetic white Texans, Texans characterized it as part of the, let me get this one, then a Gambian district, a mocking reference to a region in West Africa. Black residents served as district clerks, constables, justice of the peace, and county treasurers. The creation of Emancipation Park represented a belief in the power and promise of a new Texas, one in which black citizenship and dignity could be celebrated, even as full equality was still just a dream. And there is a celebration on the left of the Juneteenth celebration in New York City in 2022. And on the right, Juneteenth celebration in Evanston, Evanston Illinois in 2021. One, oh, both. Well, one is from Anadolu Agency via Getty and Tafon Hoskon, and the other is from Joel Lerner, Zen Harvey, Via Getty. Please forgive me. I know I just butchered your names. One of Opalie's early memories of Juneteenth was formed when she was 12 years old on June 19, 1939. An angry mob of some 500 gathered outside her family's home in a predominantly white Fort Worth neighborhood. The mob, seemingly unaware of the day's significance, simply wanted the black family gone. She and her parents and siblings fled and their house was burned. Her parents purchased another home and never mentioned the incident again. Lee, now 96, grew up to become a teacher 
and later a community activist. She had found a fond memories of attending Juneteenth celebrations as a girl, and one of her goals was to see the day recognized as a federal holiday. In 2016, she decided to lace up her tennis shoes and organize a march from her home in Fort Worth to Washington, D.C., attracting national media attention in the process. Lee's walk eventually led to the White House, where she proudly stood beside President Biden as he signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. Lee has become something of a household name known as the grandmother of Juneteenth, quote unquote, but she wasn't alone in her effort. Lawrence Thomas, a Galveston native, also received an invitation to the White House Although without the fanfare that accompanied Lee's visit, Thomas Roots in Galveston traced back to the days of slavery. Michael Meenard, one of the founders of Galveston, owned Thomas' great-great-grandfather. Thomas's ancestors helped build the city and were there when Granger stepped onto the island. His father began organizing Juneteenth celebrations in the city roughly four decades ago. All of us, no matter our politics, tend to reduce and oversimplify the historical record. Reality is messier and more nuanced. Lee and Thomas are profiled in Juneteenth Faith and Freedom, a 2022 documentary directed by my friend and fellow UT Austin professor Yaki Smith. The film is an incisive, personal, and moving examination of Juneteenth through the eyes of Black Texans who have helped push the history of that day and all the days that have followed to the forefront of the national imagination and political conscience. I recently watched a screening of the film at the Lady Bird Johnson Auditorium on the UT Austin campus. A group of around 40 gathered in the cave, I don't know, cavernous building. More students trickled in as the film began, and the crowd was deeply engaged, reverential even. At one point, we saw images of Lee and Thomas at the White House. As Thomas recounted traveling to Washington with his daughter, he shared his family story with the president, he said, and cried quite a bit. Quote, unquote. I found myself emotionally undone, tears streaming down my face while researching Juneteenth I was often reminded of the Harvard University historian Annette Gordon Reed, a native Texan who integrated her elementary school as a first grader in Conroe, north of Houston. The town now has a school named in her honor. In her 2021 book on Juneteenth, which blends history with memoir, she movingly describes her family's annual Juneteenth celebrations, complete with homemade tamales, firecrackers, barbecue, and red soda. And there is a picture of Opal Lee photographed last August. Fort Worth Star-Telegram, Getty. In her research, Gordon Reed uncovered no shortage of horrors experienced by black Texans, both before and after slavery, official end. But in her telling, he offers a provocative correction to the all too common Manichaean, Manichaean, I think that may be, portrait of Texas and America. A nation, state, and community can be two things at once, both 
Boy, these words is about to kill me. Abolitionist and pro-slavery. Integrationist and Jim Crow. All of us, no matter our politics, tend to reduce and oversimplify the historical record. Reality is messier and more nuanced. Slavery is neither an aberration nor the whole of the national character. Our telling of American history has far too long leaned toward the romantic when it could have benefited from the prosaic. And though we should not gloss over the ugliest truths, progress is also real and should be celebrated. One of Juneteenth's most important lessons is that history is about not just the country's triumphs, but more often the relentless struggle necessary to achieve a more perfect union. This ideal is profoundly evident in the stories of individuals whose lives feature both grotesque instances of violence and sublime moments of love. Their memories encapsulate the nation's arduous journey out of slavery toward a freedom we are still fighting to realize. Their undaunted faith in an expansive vision of dignity and citizenship should ennoble and inspire us all. And then it goes on to tell that Tenel Joseph is the Barbara Jordan Chair in Ethics and Political Values of at the University of Texas at Austin. His most recent book is The Third Reconstruction. This article originally appeared in the June 2023 issue of Texas Monthly with the headline, The Two Meanings of Juneteenth. And then they give the credit. So there you have the true meaning of Juneteenth. And perhaps you knew some of that, none of that, or all of that. I certainly didn't know all of it in depth. And I am a Texan, I'm a Dallas Texan, and we're having issues now with our freedmen areas of town, gentrification, is moving in and trying to move us out. That's one of the biggest things here in Oak Cliff. A lot of the freedmen, little townships were set up here and we're moments away from downtown Dallas. So we're where people would want to be. And we've been here because this was the only place we were allowed to be. And so it's really interesting and it's really unfortunate that we have gotten so far away from each other. And some of it is by choice. Some of it most is not our choice. It's by our circumstances and the environment in which we live. The very conditions of who we are. And that's what pains my heart when I think of Young Thug and all of his friends that the prosecutors have brought up to just totally emasculate those men. They are not taking into account that they were once children. And almost all of them told them that they were in some special class. And we know that when our boys are put in special classes, they're also put on special medications. And they're put on that medication for a certain period of time, and then they're taken off. What are they to do? And I know that a lot of their characters are funny, and that's who they are, and that's beautiful. But we as a nation of people, I believe in one race, and that is the human race. We as a nation of people can and should do better. 
I know it's an individual thing. And everybody has the right to choose how they want to be. But the majority of the people in this place we call the United States profess to love the Lord with their whole heart and his son, Jesus Christ. But yet you can't even share a smile or a hello or a kindness to a human that was created in the image of that that you say you love. It's very hard and that's on all sides. I'm not talking to one side. But there is one side, and not the everyday masses, the ones with the power. We're all the same to them. It doesn't matter how we look. This is the land of opportunity. And we should take advantage of the opportunity. Unfortunately for us as Asiatics, because that's how I identify now, as a Moorish American, through bloodline. I need people to understand when y'all say them Moors, those Moors, it's no them Moors, those Moors. The Moors Science Temple and the Moors Temple of Science, they were organizations in which the Honorable Noble Drew R. Lee had to set up because that's how the system works. But it was actually to teach us who we were, our history, things that we were not taught in school. And a lot of us are so, so very indoctrinated. We won't even open our minds. You don't have to believe it. Just open your mind and then start researching for yourself. Because there used to be a saying, if you want to hide something from a you-know-what, put it in a book. And you know that still rings true to this day. And today we have audio books. We really don't have to. We don't have to read if we don't want to. And you know, although I'm stumbling over words and things, but many of us on YouTube try to read and educate along with the humor and entertainment. I really wished that we could take things a little bit more serious. We're in a crisis. Our children are out of control. I understand why. What I don't understand is why do we still allow it in 2024? Laws have changed. We're supposed to be covered under the Constitution. And believe it or not, we are if we learn it and enforce the Congress, the Constitution. That is what Mr. Steele is doing on behalf of YSL, Jeffrey Williams, and all the young men that are there in that room. And it goes to show you that mistreatment, power, It has no bounds because the very people, you know, they call Atlanta the Mecca of opportunity for the Asiatic. And in Fulton County and some of the counties, you know, in close proximity, everybody that holds a position is Asiatic. But they have a culture, a culture of corruption. And it didn't just start with them, but it's so blatantly obvious with them because they were supposed to be the ones who were gonna turn things around for their people and make it an opportunity instead of a sentence of despair and penitentiary. There are a lot of bad things happening there to a lot of good people. But you know, the snake, the head must go. It must go. And the body will follow. 
But as long as you give the head an opportunity, it is going to bite you. And we see that throughout the United States. And it's so sad for me that this woman, D.A., Bonnie Willis, would get on any forum she can talking to a hurt people in a place where they say the civil rights was birthed. But everybody is still talking about a dream that Martin had. And steady dumbing down the people and taking away their creativity. Woody is so very funny. I know the world loves him. DK, I fell in love with that young man because I heard him. Bean, I didn't really hear his testimony. And I heard a little bit of ticks. But those guys are brilliant. And they don't even know it. Because they've been in a condition, in a hood, that you tuck off to the side. You know how they get tucked off and duck off? That kind of hood. But those guys are brilliant. And they have committed to crime. So no, I'm not talking about the crime. Not that poor. You do the crime, you do the time. But they've done their time. And they've tried to change their lives. And then here are these people who are grafty after a position. One to be more than they are hiring companies to see how they're doing on their social media. And nobody may never get this far into the video and hear this part. But one day you will. It is so very sad. And although we find humor in the personalities, we need to see the pain and the struggle in their lives. Everybody want to know what can they do? What can we do? What can we do? Well, I'm going to talk about that tonight. And I better get ready to get off of here so I can start preparing for my show tonight. But I'm going to talk about that. Justice delayed is justice denied. These men deserve better. And everybody's so afraid to say something. But I'll tell you, it's some people out here really telling these stories. And one that I really, really, really love the way he break it down. And he breaks it down. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at Evan films, but you should. And he does some awesome research. But he has analytical sense. Critical thinking ability, creativity, entrepreneurial, and down in the streets. I never thought I'd hear a politician talk about the dirty South. And that's what Fonnie Willis said about the dirty, dirty South, she said. And they're dirty. There is Lady Pink, known as L.A. Pink. Her YouTube is Street Rumors. She's out here fighting for the people. And she ain't asking for no shout out. She and her husband are doing what they were called to do. She's obedient to her purpose. That's an awesome feat. We have Phil Holloway. Melanie King, Infamous Sylvia, Steady Nat, Thugger Daly, Robert Gobert, and the lawyer. He's so handsome, I, I probably can't even remember his name. The lawyer you knew. It's another young man that I've started looking at recently. Because I try to look at everybody that talks about Young Thug. I really 
really, really appreciate everybody that covers this story because everybody should be talking about it. Everybody. Of course, we like to just put each other down and talk about one another, try to make money off of one another, destroy each other. Professor Nez, the real A-Dog, J.D., a lawyer, he's from Missouri. These people are doing a beautiful job. Choke no joke. The luncheon lawyer. And uh, one of my favorites is, I'm not a lawyer, but. And then Nick Starro. And I believe he's all the way in Sweden. Then we have Danielle. She's a lawyer. So we have some people out here doing the best they can. And I want to thank Law and Crime and Eleven Alive, Fox 5, A&M, Atlanta News First. I want to thank you all because I used you all to help tell the story. From what I know. And I just came in at the end. You guys have been with this story from the beginning. And looking at that young man, Jeffrey. I'm not saying he didn't do wrong and he wasn't bad or whatever you want to call him. But he's humble. And you can tell that he's shy. And from what all of his friends say, he wanted them to leave the streets alone. He gave them jobs. He gave them opportunity. But they were caught up in their everyday lives. It's kind of like when you're trying to help a child that lives in an abusive home. You may take them out for a day to the park, to the circus, to get ice cream. But they have to go back home and live in that environment. So they learn to adapt to whatever environment they're in. Our children are far too adult-wise and not getting what they need to be able to function if something should happen to us as their parent. We need to be preparing them to be competitive for the world. But there are still in some areas laws inside a law. And we're going to continue to push forward. But if we don't teach our children the truth, they're going to return. I heard Donald Trump say that one time, and, and people got angry at him for saying, if you don't know where you come from, then you'll end up where you came from. And we say that all the time to each other. You don't know where you're going. You're going to end right back where you started from. And we've had hard times, and we've had good times. And I've tried to find different things because a lot of the things that I would love to share with the world, some call it misinformation. Whatever the reason, there's not a freeness to speak on our plight and what has happened to us. We can't talk about the genocide that's happening to us, but we can acknowledge everyone else's. And it's really painful. And it's... You don't own anything. So you have to do this and do this and do that. Kind of like the judge 
He's not interested in him breaking the law or the rules of ethics in every government job and every job. But certainly a government job. You have to take every year an ethics course. And he's not worried about what he did wrong and teaming up with the prosecution and the whole world can see it except for those who don't want to he want to know who told you and we all can see that's wrong that is so wrong we've heard people answer questions Never denying the wrongdoing, because he's never denied it. As a matter of fact, he admitted it. As a matter of fact, he gave a lot of the information because he said the things that Mr. Seal thought he knew, that he was parroting what was being said. And we know what parrots do. They repeat what they've heard. So, I just ask, don't do it for me. Do it for your babies and your grandbabies. Start reading. Please start reading. And I know many people have issues with Dr. Umar. And you all can do your judgments, you good Christians. But I'm here to tell you, if he never built a school, that's on him. But the lives that he's helping these parents, and it's a many parents can attest to it, I say hats off because he helped me. The individual can decide at any point when they want to stop giving. Everybody talks about him receiving monies for the school and everybody that's monetized want money for what they do here on YouTube. Talking. Even if you're researching, because I research too. No matter what it is that you're offering, a workman is worthy of his hire. And no, he don't have to say that he's going to build no school and it took him 15 years to do it. Maybe not. But maybe so, because maybe that's in his heart. It's just not humanly capable. And then maybe he'll make a lie out of everybody. I don't know. I gave when I could. But I also gave the people that was here and bullied me. Dr. Omar never disrespected me. Who took my money and called me mom. Said I was a dear friend. Somebody they could talk to. Some call me auntie. But turned against me and bullied me to no end. So it happens to the best of us. But I am who I say I am. And I will return for as often as I choose. Why? Because this is my purpose. I just happen to only have me. That's what I have to give. My knowledge, my wisdom, my 65 years. I would love to have real conversations with people about real life issues. But I know it's not wise to tell your whole story on YouTube. And you don't have to, but I've told mine. Nobody else has to do that. You don't have to do that. But I tell you, we all fall short of other people's expectations. And sometimes even our own. I'm going to leave you with my mantra. To thine own self be true. If you're true to you, you'll be true to everybody you meet. And they may not like your truth. <laughs> okay. As long as you don't harm them and allow them to harm you, no harm has been done. None. I hope that you learned something from this Juneteenth. And perhaps you will subscribe to my channel. 
and learn a little bit more. I'm all over the place. That's what I do. I'm all over the place. I earned it. And I am proud. So I want to ask if you would subscribe, if you would like, if you would share this video or share the information that you heard from the video. If you would leave a comment, if it's nothing but an emoji, I don't have a big following. And so in order for us to be put out for people to want to see us or to find us, YouTube needs to know that we are actually engaging people and people want to hear what we have to say. I'm going to be here until they tell me, well, you just didn't get enough. And we have to let you go. Or unless I decide I don't want to do this anymore. It takes a lot out of me with congestive heart failure. But I'm willing to do it. I put in a lot of preparation. I read a lot, research a lot. I'm just not computer savvy. No, am I technological savvy? So, what you get is what what you see is what you get. And I know that you guys do not see me. I normally be on the camera a lot, but when I read and stuff, I had cataract surgery, and I have to wear these reading glasses and. Sometimes me and my eyes adjusting here on this computer. And then, you know, I'm toothless tiger. And sometimes, you know, I'm a person. I'm a stickler for words. And if people mess up words, I used to correct them and all that. But now I mess up more words than anybody I know. And sometimes my tongue seems like it's getting twisted and tangled up with my gums because I ain't got no teeth. So it's just, you know, one of them things. But I do the best I can. And I will continue. Um, I believe the children are our future. And I sing. Not because I'm a singer. But because it calms me. It is a part of my self-therapy. Man, know thyself. And because I love to sing... I play them on my videos. Some people have a problem with it. They probably don't have to come back. <laughs> because that may be why I'm not growing to. I don't know. I would say that uh, it is what it is. But I will sing until I can't sing anymore. Uh, because uh, I love it. I love it. I really love to hear my voice. But I can't sing with nobody else. I'll start laughing. I really will. So, on that note, consider joining my membership. I do have membership. So, if you would, and it's as little as 99 cents, which 99 cents wouldn't really help me, but I was running a special, and it's just there. But $1.99, $2.99, you know, the choice is yours if you can afford it. You can hit a super thanks. I hate the word thanks. I like thank you. But that's what they put. And so I have to accept that. Or you can cash at me. It's scrolling. I should say scrolling. Because I don't think it's moving. Like walking. It's scrolling across the bottom. Of the screen. I'm going to leave you with the greatest love. This is Toothless. And I'm leaving the Tiger's Den. Hope to see you tonight. Goodbye. I believe the children are future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter 
Remind us who we used to be. Everybody searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone to fulfill my needs. A lonely place to be. So I learned to depend on me. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I failed, if I succeed, at least I'll live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. And if I sense that special place that you've been dreaming of takes you to a lonely place, find yourself in love. 